Thank you. Everyone, welcome to the 2022 Planetary Health Annual Meeting at Harvard University. We are about to move into another exciting and fast-paced session of lightning rounds and discussions. We will hear from six different scholars, Fiona Doherty, Joe Middleton, Josh Colston, Hassini Gunasidi, uh, Sotiris Vardulakis, and Claudia Rubiarti. After presentations, there will be 30 minutes for discussions with presenters, and each presenter will have 30, three minutes to present their research. We will move quickly from one percent presentation to the next. All right, first up we'll have Fiona Diodriti. Hello, can everyone hear me all right? Hi, my name is Fiona Doherty. I'm a doctoral student at The Ohio State University College of Social Work. Thank you so much for the opportunity sh to share this research project in such a beautiful room today. Uh, so let me find my clicker. This project emerged from a conversation with a farm agency in Columbus, Ohio. They serve farmers throughout the Midwest, and they express concerns around stress uh, within the beginning farmers that they serve in particular. So beginning farmers are farmers who have been farming for 10 years or less. They're defined by the USDA as historically underserved. And they are, well, when compared to more uh, established farmers, they are a group growing in diversity. Beginning farmers are critical for shaping a resilient food system and also for mitigating climate change through sustainable land management practices. So our aims were to understand Midwestern beginning farmers, one, systemic stressors, and two, barriers to stress management. We embraced a critical ecosystems and intersectional lens to really get at understanding some of the overlapping social identities as they relate to systemic oppression and systemic stressors. This was a mixed method study with the prioritized strand as the qualitative strand. In um, October of 2020, we administered online surveys and survey measures included farm stress, the patient health questionnaire, which is a me measure of mental health symptomology, symptoms, um, and farm characteristics and sociodemographic information. The survey then informed the development of semi-structured interviews to really get at more detailed understanding of farm ex stress experiences. Then in April 2021, we conducted 20 semi-structured interviews. These interviews were um, analyzed qualitatively using a thematic analysis with member checking. Really run through the results quickly. I want to linger on that last one for a second. So some of our themes that emerged were the stress of capitalism as a stressor and a barrier to stress management. Next was discrimination and inequitable access to resources. This was really salient to participants in our sample who were women, uh, members of the LGBTQ plus population, and BIPOC farmers. Next was social support aids and gaps. Uh, social isolation and loneliness were huge, very common. Rugged individualism emerged as social stigma that um, related to seeking care. And then lastly, we had mixed perspectives of climate change as a stressor. So in our survey, this was the fourth most common source of stress, with 79% of respondents reporting it. However, our interviewees had much diverse uh, perspectives on this as a stressor. So no concern or actually thinking it was a good thing uh, to feeling helpless or just totally overwhelmed, we can't do anything around climate change, to feeling like climate change is a major source of stress. So lastly, uh, despite the varying sort of perspectives and opinions about climate change, it will compound all of these other existing stressors among this population and should be at the forefront of intervention strategies and structural support. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Joe Middleton. So medically neglected populations in biodiverse areas often face a terrible trade-off between their own health and conservation. So to give you an example, I work in Papua New Guinea and many communities there will work with loggers because 
logging roads will enable them to get out to secondary care to hospital and the limited amount of income they get can pay for at least some medications. So to avoid this trade-off, uh, we've been working with Indigenous communities protecting 150 square kilometres of rainforest by the provision of medical services in those communities. So uh, on the far right, we've got our, uh, one of our clinics in Wenang Conservation Area. Now, when we first set it up, we were looking to learn lessons from other projects, but we found that the evidence base for this kind of work wasn't really brought together. So once we'd established our work, we came back to this question and working with conservation through public health and in Health in Harmony, we looked to try and bring the evidence of these projects together. So specifically, projects which provided medical services with the, with the outcomes looking for both health and biodiversity conservation. We knew that most of these projects may not be in the academic literature, so we worked through professional networks such as the International Union for Conservation Nature, Plant Tree Health and others to bring in collaborators to submit data from their projects. We ended up um, getting data on where projects were, what they were doing, what their outcomes were, who funded them, problems involved, etc. Uh, and we ended up with um, 43 projects across 22 countries. So most of the uh, most common projects were in in sub-Saharan Africa, followed by Southeast Asia. Uh, the habitats which we saw a lot of these interventions in were tropical rainforests, followed by coral reefs. And interventions were diverse, so they might range from small kind of add-on health uh, projects onto existing conservation programs, such as vaccination rounds um, around communities, around national parks, to more complex long-term projects, such as the construction of clinics, or in one case, actually the building of a district hospital. In terms of specific medical interventions, by far the most common uh, service provided was reproductive health. But even when reproductive health was the focus, in most cases, these projects were providing other medical services as well. Second to reproductive health was the provision of primary care, mostly by clinic building and, and maintenance. So we found that integrating medical provision and conservation is more widespread than the literature would suggest. In fact, over half of the projects we found have never been reported in the academic literature. They're mostly work carried out by non-governmental organisations. Good quality evaluations demonstrate it can be highly effective, this approach. However, some projects did lack some ability to evaluate. And if you look on this diagram here, we have kind of health components in one direction, conservation outcomes in the other. And sometimes it was difficult to ascertain the link in the theories of change between one aspect of the project and another. There was various reasons for this, but one of the major reasons was that funding is usually provided on a siloed basis for either health or conservation. And this is a barrier to improved um, evaluation because the metrics on health and the metrics on conservation, given that they've been funded from different providers, are temporally and spatially often mismatched. So this is a barrier also to kind of scaling up this really effective on-the-ground planetary health intervention type. So to tackle this, funder engagement and development of evaluation guidelines are planned and we'll soon be publishing our results in full, and we aim to repeat this mapping exercise every two to three years. So this work is only possible by the data submission and, and, and work of 48 organisations collaborating together. Um, if you're interested more in both our work developing uh, guidelines for evaluation and funding, and also our mapping work, as well as kind of some more on-the-ground grassroots perspectives, we have a follow-on meeting next week where I'll be speaking about work in Papua New Guinea. Gladys will be speaking about work with conservation through public health in Uganda. And we'll be taking people through how we're moving this forward with new guidelines for funders and uh, participants. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Now we have Josh Colston. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Josh Colston. Hopefully, you can all share my slide, uh, see my slides that I'm sharing. Uh, I'm, I'm joining you from Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, I can't Josh. Be there in One second. We're getting getting the slides up right now. Oh, okay. Um, so while that's happening, I'll just um, explain that, uh, oh, yeah, I'm at the University of Virginia in the um, D Division of Infectious Diseases. We do a lot of work on enteric pathogen transmission, uh, bugs that cause diarrhea, particularly in young children, still a significant cause of uh, morbidity and mortality and with long-term sequelae that li last throughout the life course. Um, All right, they're up now, Josh, thank you. They're up, and am I controlling them? Yes. Okay, here we go. So, yeah, as I was saying, enteric infectious diseases um, still a significant cause of morbidity and mortality, um, and caused by many different pathogens, viruses, bacteria, etc., that um, 
that are differentially sensitive to environmental factors and, and climate. So, um, and then if we think of planetary health as um, emphasizing interdependence of human health with Earth's, Earth's natural systems, we start to see the kind of link here. It, here's like a conceptual diagram of how Earth's natural systems sort of intersect with that infection transmission uh, risk. So we've established this project called the Planetary Child Health Observatory um, to model uh, some of these uh, interactions between climate planetary processes and, and uh, enteric infectious disease risks. So we're bringing together a lot of data from PCR diagnostics from different studies, Earth observation or satellite based data on climate at a very uh, spatio-temporally disaggregated resolution and survey and household subject, uh, subject data. Um, and so here, here you can see, uh, this is from an analysis of the bacteria Shigella that we've been doing recently, which is a, a, a pathogen that's targeted for, for vaccines coming through the pipeline pretty, pretty soon. And here you can see the, um, all the places we've got um, data coming from. So um, we, uh, 23 studies in 24 countries so far, um, and we're georeferencing these results to, to locations of villages and things. Um, and here, here are some of the, um, some of the uh, variables we're bringing together. So this is sort of a separate project that intersects, and, and this is the coverage of Finnish floors. So people who, uh, people who rather than having like bare earth floors, which, which are um, risk factor for pathogen transmission, they have it like covered with uh, wood or concrete or something like that. That's the prevalence. Um, we're gonna be uh, publishing that soon. You know, um, static covariates like enhanced vegetation index, and then time varying ones, which we can match to the date and location of the, the stool sample. We're getting our, our epidemiological data from uh, stool samples analyzed by PCR. So this is an average of um, soil moisture, which is a variable we found to be associated with a lot of enteric pathogen transmission. And then his preliminary results, when we, you know, we put all these into a model, and then we, uh, we sort of spatial, uh, spatially temporally interpolate it and so and then averaged over the year this is it this is how um shigella prevalence looks this is an asymptomatic children so um you know these pathogens are sensitive to the sort of um conditions that are the focus of a planetary health lens um conditions in much of sub-saharan africa are propitious for shigella transmission we've identified hot spots in particular locations and we're going to make uh, these predictions available um, via an online dashboard in the in the coming months and years. Um, and that's the uh, preprint that's available. It's under review at the moment and contact information, etc. cetera. Um, look forward to answering questions and um, yeah, any follow up that anyone may have. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Josh. Um, up next, we have Hasini Gunasiri. Share my screen. Yeah. Can you all see? Yep. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Hassini Gunasiri, a PhD student from Deakin University, Australia. Today, I'm going to present findings from a secondary data analysis of a nationwide survey conducted to explore the relative personal concerns of Australians in 2020. As we know, climate change continues to increase faster than anticipated, making it a major global health issue. In Australia, mental health issues such as eco-anxiety, solastalgia, and depression are escalating due to climate change. Some population groups, including young people, are especially vulnerable to these mental health impacts. The aim of this analysis... Oh, sorry, you're muted right now. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll start from the beginning. Uh, I'm Hassini Gunasiri. Sorry about that again. Um, I'm a PhD student from Deakin University, Australia. So today I'm going to present findings from a secondary data analysis of a nationwide survey conducted to explore the relative personal concerns of Australians in 2020. As we know, climate change continues to increase faster than anticipated, making it a major global health issue. In Australia, mental health issues such as eco-anxiety, solastalgia, and depression are escalating due to climate change. Some population groups, including young people, are especially vulnerable to these mental health impacts. 
the aim of this analysis was to explore the relative as um, was to explore the association between climate change and young people's mental health. So out of the 5,483 individuals who completed this national survey, 281 were young people aged 18 to 24 years. This survey included demographic questions and measures of the impacts of climate change on survey respondents' mental health. Hierarchical regression, analysis of covariance and logistic, logistic regression were conducted to examine the relationship between age and the dependent variables eco-anxiety, pre-trauma and PTSD. Next, an ANCOVA was run to identify significant differences in eco-anxiety between those who have and have not had a direct experience of climate change. We tested four hypotheses. There, young people will report significantly higher eco-anxiety, pre-trauma symptoms and post-trauma symptoms than other age groups, and young people with direct experience of a climate change related event will have significantly higher rates of eco-anxiety than those without direct experience. According to these graphs, we can see that the odds of young people having eco-anxiety and pre-trauma are higher than other age groups. However, the odds of young people aged 18 to 24 years having PTSD symptoms was lower than that of 25 to 34 year olds. The table shows us that eco-anxiety in young people with direct experience of a climate change event was higher compared to those without direct experience. Climate-related mental health is a planetary health issue, especially for young people in Australia. This research provides evidence of a significant link between climate change and young people's mental health. The health sector must reorient mental health practice to manage mental health impacts of climate change on young people. Thank you. Thank you, Asini. Claudia Robiarty. Okay, thank you. So, hello everyone. Thanks so much for having me here today. I'm Claudia Robiarty and I'm a project manager and research associate at STEMA. And in a few seconds, I'll explain to you what is STEMA. And today, uh, I'll be happy to share with you some preliminary results of a study we're performing in Kenya about large-scale planetary health challenges and positive community health. Um, okay. So, STEMA, uh, we are a not-for-profit organization based in the UK, and we work with uh, with an extensive, ext sorry, extensive network of local partners to um, develop new approaches to community health and sustainable development. We mainly use systems thinking approach and resourcefulness approaches uh, to, um, to increase participation and community-led research and enhance that innovation and decision-making. So the Kenya project, uh, we are collating research project. We are our three amazing partners, SWAP, MAMA, and PDO. And the, the aim of the project is to enhance community resourcefulness and define community positive health and the systems of resources behind it. So uh, we performed a multi-site research project that is still ongoing. And we work with different groups of community members across three uh, different field sites in Baringo, CI and Nakuru counties. We used system thinking approach and a mixture of qualitative and participatory um, um, tools. Uh, we engage different community members. And these are some uh, picture of the activities we, we performed with our communities. So uh, preliminary findings um, identified the building blocks of community positive health and how communities in Kenya are leveraging uh, these uh, building blocks into a community level system. And also we identified uh, that um, communities um, in Kenya, um, uh, they um, link positive health, uh, their identity and their vision uh, uh, with an in, um, a complex network of natural resources. Um, and 
there, there is a quote here from from one of our community and, and also a very sad uh, photo uh, that um, represent um, this quote. Um, also, um, community positive health was described as more pronounced in the past, and I reported here two quotes from our communities because today is also an opportunity for them to, to bring their voices, to share their voices here. So population was less back then, as resources available were enough for everyone. Environmental pollution was less, leading to a healthy community. There was enough rainfall to promote agricultural activities. They valued trees a lot and took care of the environment. Rivers were many and clean back then. They knew the importance of taking care of the environment. Our preliminary findings also indicated that one of the greatest challenge for the community was climate change, mainly associated with droughts, flood, and natural resource degradation. Uh, here's, uh, here is another quote. Um, it hasn't rained this year. Seasons have changed some time back. We used to plant crop once, and nowadays we do it twice. It is also difficult to predict the best month to get a good harvest. You find that if you do it early enough, you don't get good harvest. And if you do it late, you also don't get. So our preliminary results show that large-scale planetary health challenges reach small-scale community systems of positive health. Our communities provided us with information-rich insights on how uh, their community systems of health have become um, impacted over recent times by local environmental and climate changes. <clears throat> and also planetary health concepts and challenges are shaping community health, community identity and community vision, mainly by limiting the availability and agency over natural resources. Um, findings will be, of course, refined, um, and we are planning to have a further stage of research, research to co-produce with our partners a pilot tested uh, toolkit to enable research smallness-based approaches um, for community planetary health. Thanks so much. Over to you. Thank you to all of our wonderful Lightning Talk presenters. Um, we are now going to move into the discussion portion of our Lightning Talks. Um, we are going to ask that anyone who has a live question come up to either of these microphones uh, ladies, uh, placed in the hallway. And I do have the Zoom open on my laptop here. So if anyone online has questions, please put them in the Q&A function, and I'll pass them along to our in-person presenters. Okay. Uh, well, hi everyone. Gloria Blaze, PhD candidate at Cornell University. Um, yes, excellent lightning talks, and I'd love to ask questions to everyone, but I can't. So my question is primarily for Joe. Um, we're trying to do something similar in Haiti, trying to map out where these um, agroforestry programs are operating, and a couple of them are actually health-based. Um, my question is, are there any public, um, once you do these exercises, are they made public for the community to be able to see what's going on? Or is it just between the programs to be able to see what's going on? And I think the question also applies to everyone else. Are you putting your findings out to the public to see how we could actually, I guess, mobilize action amongst the communities that you're working with? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, yes, our evidence map um, will be published as a kind of academic output but actually all of the data within it is being, uh, will be made open access and available to anyone who wants to do sub-analysis of it, for instance. So it was an evidence mapping process, so we're, for instance, not doing a meta-analysis of uh, all the different types of subgroup interventions. Sometimes it, there, there's some heterogeneity in interventions and outcomes, so that might be difficult across the board, but uh, really it's a collaborative effort. So yeah, we want to make the information we will do openly available to anyone, but also in terms of publishing it, and I think this is a lesson maybe for other projects doing it, we've had quite good buy-in and involvement from, from collaborators, and the reason why we've done that is we're making sure that everyone who submits data and keeps involved in writing the papers, uh, is credited as co-authors on it. We're putting authorship in alphabetical order by last name. And we're not looking to kind of really seize this data as our property. It's, it's there out for the planetary health community generally. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, yeah, this question is also for Joe. Um, I'm Thomas at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. Um, but I was curious if you could speak maybe to some of the specific projects um, that you had highlighted. I'd be particularly curious, I saw some kind of on both the health and conservation side, um, projects related to, to spillover events and, and controlling that. Hmm. Um, so I was curious if yeah, you could speak, just speak to some of the specifics of that. Yeah, so um, obviously there's a kind of constellation of different types of integrated health and conservation projects. And the Ecological Levers for Health collaboration, who have actually participated heavily in our work, they've mapped really well this kind of whole constellation of different types of interventions. And within that is obviously habitat protection to stop zoonotic spillover. And, you know, we should think the other... The, the other direction as well, about anthroponotic diseases spilling over from humans to wildlife populations as well. So um, I think that's a really important area, and especially post-COVID, we should be really thinking about that kind of preventative public health. Our work, because we wanted to make sure we had quite narrow uh, inclusion criteria, so we could really relatively, you know, be confident we had most projects. We're looking at projects which just provided explicit medical services with conservation and health outcomes. So we weren't looking, for instance, at uh, protection of habitats to improve health through recreation, which is a very common integrated approach in national parks in the global north. And we weren't ex just looking at uh, zoonotic spillover avoidance from habitats. But actually, in the way of these things, of course, a very large proportion of the projects which were providing medical services coming from a planetary health perspective were also actively thinking about uh, reducing zoonotic risk. Uh, that was less so in sub-Saharan Africa, but it was definitely the case in Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Hi, thank you for that uh, research uh, and sharing those findings. Uh, this is a question again for all of you, whoever wants to take it. I'm wondering, uh, well, last year I had the pleasure to visit uh, the Institute of uh, East Global in Barcelona, and they're doing a bunch of research in different fields and air pollution and uh, the exposome and just amazing amounts of research. And one of the things that was really pleasant surprise was that they they had a, a department within the research institutes that would take the research findings and translate that directly into policy. And this was led by a former Ministry of Health, so she already had a bunch of the connections that could take that knowledge and translate it into actionable policy. I'm wondering if in your institutes or the institutions that you represent, there is anything similar to that, or how do you plan to take some of the research findings that are you're emerging from your research, taking that into more actionable uh, items that then we can see in, in, in the forms of solutions. And if there isn't any, what, what do you imagine that would look like in an institution like yours? So thank you again for sharing those, your, re, your important research. I can speak a little bit about uh, my partnership with the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association. So it was the farm organization that we partnered with through for this project. Um, we used a highly community engaged framework and I feel very lucky because the organization has a very powerful established policy team. Um, I think it speaks to a question that was raised earlier about public impact and how are we disseminating research results beyond the ivory tower. And uh, with OFA, we're planning an op-ed for the Columbus Dispatch to really link some of our research results and uh, build them into conversations around the next farm bill. Uh, and what that can look like. So I think that's really important. We're also in review for an open access journal uh, to publish uh, these findings more broadly so they're accessible to all, uh, not just those who have uh, institutional access. Perspective. So uh, we're part of Sussex Sustainability Research Program. And yeah, so we have a staged approach to, to policy integration. Um, and so a lot of our work is around uh, integrating sustainable development goals and we've uh, directly contributed to high level meetings at the UN on, on that aspect and we're looking from the basis of our mapping work to set up an international roundtable next spring of practitioners, uh, policy makers especially from international agencies and funders uh, uh, to kind of see if we can move on supporting that kind of integrated medical provision and conservation both incorporating it into funding calls and into strategies within SDG integration at the moment, especially with COVID-19, the SDGs are in crisis, and if we're going to achieve uh, substantive progress on them, it's got to be on the basis of simultaneous action across the SDGs. Thank you. Tatiana? Next question. Hi. Good morning. I'm Tatiana from Brazil. Uh, my question is for Fiona. Uh, I work, Fiona, with some uh, rural women and 
like two months ago, I had a, 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 like a course about climate change for rural women. And uh, I presented a, a research which was conducted in Brazil in 2020 with, in, within a, a big event which is called Daisy's March with 100,000 women about climate change and how to comprehend this as a challenge for them. And in Brazil, our numbers are like 89% of them identifies climate change as a, a major challenge. And um, they are her women with very poor education majority. So I was thinking about your, uh, your, your public. How, how are the characteristics that they, education now level, how do you, uh, what is the, 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 this kind of uh, characteristics of her sample? Sure, yeah. Uh, so beginning farmers uh, are very diverse, and our particular sample in partnering with the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association, uh, we ended up with a lot of small-scale, sustainably-oriented farmers, so uh, I think that's important to note. Uh, these folks tend to be moderately to highly educated. Um, they tend to be, um, I think, all across the board as far as socioeconomic levels. Um, and I, it's interesting to hear some of your results around, you know, the priority of climate change as a source of stress, right? And I think this project for me has opened up, up more questions than answers in that uh, topic area, which is really exciting. And I see a lot of alignment with the Planetary Health Alliance framework um, to continue this work. So I'm, I'm pumped over here. Um, and I think for me, I'm thinking, you know, why... Why were there such mixed perspectives around climate change as a source of stress? And I think uh, one hypothesis is that you know, there are more prominent or pressing things on their minds, uh, such as um, keeping the farm afloat. You know, I think a lot of folks start up capital and land access when you're beginning is very, very difficult. And so that becomes the priority. And uh, climate change, even though it's still very present in here, seems to be a more uh, seemingly far away issue. Did I answer your question? I yeah, know I kind of yeah, went all yeah. around, but. We could share more, and uh, I was thinking now, now that you answered, I was thinking that my, my sample, my, my, this big sample, is from a rural women movement, mm -hmm. that it's so connected with environmental movement. So maybe, the, why this difference? So maybe we could share more after, thank yeah, you. Thank yeah. you so much, and I'll add to, so yeah, our uh, farmers were from urban, uh, suburban and rural areas. Thanks. Let's talk more. Thank you. I do want to uh, take a step back and see if any of our virtual presenters wanted to chime in on the previous question that was addressed to all presenters. Was that the one about the, um, you know, sharing with policymakers and all that? Yes, I believe so. I, yeah. Well, from my perspective, I'm, I'm just very envious of uh, IS Global and, and all the other institutions that we've heard from. That is a real issue for for us here, and for I think a lot I think a lot of people can relate to that we're so focused on you know getting funding and producing papers of these analyses um, that it really leaves us very little bandwidth for um, for thinking about these um, you know broader broader downstream things of of um, how to engage policymakers or decision makers. Uh, that's real. That's a real kind of problem, and one that I'm, I, I, you know, I'm I'm really open to suggestions for if anyone wants to contact me. Um, what we're doing, what we're doing is we're we're trying to engage um, researchers and investigators in, um, you know, endemic uh, countries endemic for enteric infectious diseases, like in the in the tropics in the global south. Um, trying to engage particularly early career researchers we're starting up a consortium of um collaborators that we're, we're hoping is going to be like you know two-thirds based in in low middle income countries um give a platform to early career researchers there um and hopefully the you know with these people's connections um the uh you know our recommendations will sort of diffuse out i don't know what the i don't have any, much more of a clearer idea than that but um I don't know. I'm I'm very interested to hear what other people have to say about this. Before I take our next question, any input from any of our 
presenters? Yeah. Okay, my, my name is Asad. I'm a PhD research fellow at University of Oslo, and I'm campus ambassador in Planetary Health Alliance. So I work in the environmental dimension of antibiotic resistance, and that's why I'm interested uh, my question to Josh Colston, like uh, about this modeling risk of, and the spatial temporal variation. Do you consider the maternal microbiome or the, because it's only the kids, uh, the infant, uh, enteric pathogen. So are you take, taking into account about the maternal microbiome during the modeling for the enteric infection in the uh, uh, children? Because in our recent article, we found that who are arsenic contaminated mother and kids, like they both are contaminated with arsenic uh, drinking water and they are highly contaminated with resistant bacteria. So it's just an observational study, but we, we did not uh, find or we did not do any study how it's transmitted because it's less than six months of age. So they are completely best fit or they are not exclusively uh, exposed to the environment, but they are highly contaminated with the enteric pathogen who, sh who should not be there. So do you think anything like, uh, do you include the mothers in, the, in your discussion? Thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting. I hadn't come across that paper, so I'll, I'll look out for it. So you're saying that uh, maternal arsenic exposure affects the um, the uh, risk of enteric infections of the kids. That's that's very interesting. Um, you know, I I do do work at a smaller scale than what I presented here. Um, I'm not aware of any you know big global scale data sets on arsenic exposure. Um, if there are, um, that's definitely something we'll look into. But you know. Um, in, in my work on, you know, more community level exposure, um, I, I'd be very interested to um, incorporate that and maybe get some ground based measurements of, you know, arsenic presence in, in, in water sources, groundwater and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's def th thanks a lot for bringing that up. Um, I'll definitely keep that on my radar. We have a question coming in online for Claudia from uh, Emily Selland. Uh, Emily's asking if this project targets specific diseases that you spoke about. So do the communities you work with ever identify specific issues or are you focused more broadly on broad ecosystem services of health? Yeah, thanks so much for this question. Very interesting. I, I've just replied in the chat, but I'm happy to, to reply also here, of course. So uh, we usually, um, I mean, our project, our approach envisages an holistic concept of health. So we don't target diseases. We work with communities, we engage them um, to, to, to reflect together on what matters uh, to them um, uh, to, to reach uh, positive health driven by local agendas. And so a lot of domains usually come, come up uh, during this process and they are generally very broad and they span from more tangible uh, um, build the blocks of positive health like water and nutrition to uh, natural resources to infrastructures and also to intangible um, uh, domains like knowledge and social cohesion so yeah it's a more um, a broad approach involving system thinking and uh, we don't really target specific diseases over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jeremy? Hi, yes. My name is Jeremy. I'm the senior program coordinator at the Planetary Health Alliance. And this follows up on Carlos's question on action. I'm just curious, what can the Planetary Health Alliance Secretariat or the Alliance as a whole, this room, do to support your work, your research, your next steps? And to anyone. I'll say something. So, um, five and a half years ago, so I, I came to, to uh, Harvard for the first Planetary Health Alliance meeting, and we came there to, kind of, to um, seek advice, actually, on how to set up our Integrated Health and Conservation Project. And large amounts of the success of our work on the ground in Papua New Guinea came as a result of the contacts we made with, here within the Planetary Health Alliance. So, one thing I think that, you know, can't be undervalued, uh, overvalued for... Um, especially for people who aren't here in person, really, is the, is the contacts that member institutions in 
PHA really can can help each other. And I think that's that remains probably the most valuable thing the Secretariat can do, I think, is like connecting those institutions globally that are working on the ground, you know, with a planetary health approach. So, um, and in fact, many of the contributors to our mapping, as well as the continued advisors of our work on the ground, all have, been, have come through contacts we've made here within the network. So I think that, that kind of supporting that horizontal level of communication is, is incredibly important. But in, in terms of policy work I think, and funder work, I think connecting and bridging, bridging with funders and, um, and policy makers around some of these more systemic changes is, is going to be very helpful too. Okay, Anyone else like to jump in before we take the next question? I can speak a little bit to that. Um, so I come from the field of social work. This is my first Planetary Health Alliance meeting. It's been great. Uh, thank you for, for having it and hosting. Social work, we are uh, getting closer to understanding the importance of environmental justice. I would say it's a burgeoning and emerging and a, a growing edge within the field of social work. Um, a lot of potential and importance, right, because it will compound all existing social justice issues that we are currently uh, experiencing. I see a lot of alignment between social work core values and the framework of the Planetary Health Alliance, right? So solutions focused, really focused on movement building, these systems approach. So from my perspective, I think spreading the word, right? Like I'm gonna go back home and I'm gonna tell all of my social work peers um, about this framework and I think just really spreading the word is, is most important. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jules Alejandre. I'm a PhD candidate at Glasgow College and University. My question is for Hassini. Um, about the um, mental health of young people in Australia, do you have any insights of um, forms of coping strategies or mental health interventions that uh, could be accessible to these young people and how are they accessing this the kinds of interventions? Thanks. Thank you so much for the question. Um, uh, I, I apologize first if I'm not answering properly. It's like 3.30 here in the morning, so I can't think properly. But um, uh, yeah, mental health interventions is a must, I think. But what we found was we don't have like specific mental health interventions specifically for climate change. Um, so we actually followed up this project by another project. Um, with a group bottle building approach. So we um, gathered up some mental health practitioners and um, um, psychologists to have a uh, talk about this topic, specifically on young people's mental health related to climate change and talked about what can we do about it. And we came across um, um, some aspects such as like accessibility to mental health, um, services especially in rural areas in australia um and uh yeah so we have a set of actions and ideas uh, and interventions um such as um making more awareness around the climate change impacts of young people um especially uh, with the mental health practitioners and yeah um i if um I can get back to you later and I can give my email address so I can think properly <laughs> and give you a better answer in terms of thank you. Great. I think if you drop that in the chat, we can make sure you two connect. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Do that. Are there any other questions from our attendees in person? Hi, I'm Teddy Potter from the University of Minnesota, and this is more a comment. Um, Jeremy asked, what can the Secretariat do? And my question is back to the audience, is what can the PHA community do? I really highly urge all of you to go to the Sapala Declaration on Planetary Health. Find the sector that most closely aligns with your work, and then ask, like Fiona did, um, what can we do for the emerging um, people in that field? How can we lift them up? How can we listen deeply to their needs and pull them into the circle? So thank you all for your wonderful work, but it falls on us as a community to continue on the work. Thank you, Teddy. Would any of our presenters like to Chime in on anything else you feel you haven't covered. I have a question for Hassini, and 
uh, you had said there was um, a difference between the youth you, in your study in PTSD, and their measure of PTSD was lower compared to those who were age 24 and older. Do you have any uh, theories or ideas of why that might be? Um, we actually don't know. I think probably because they have more experience, just the age difference, and they have experienced more um, climate change-related extreme events. So that's the only uh, theory that we can think of for now. Um, but yeah, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, thanks for that. Great. Well, I think we've gone through everyone's questions. So I'd just like to take a moment and thank all of our wonderful Lightning Talk presenters for joining us today. Um, this has been marvelous. Um, and before we do break for lunch, I would like to invite up, back up to the podium Dr. Marie Suter and Dr. Jamila Mahmoud for a very exciting announcement. And thank you so much, Joe and Fiona, for joining us live. Um, well, before we move over to lunch, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about lunch, but um, we have a really, really exciting announcement. And we were going to do this at the end of the day, but we wanted to make sure that people who might be leaving would hear this announcement and be aware of this. Um, it is our sincere pleasure that the next annual meeting for 2024 will be held at Sunway Center, Planetary Health in Malaysia. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marie, Sam, and everyone at the Alliance. Um, you know, we, as I said, we are a young center, but we really want to learn. And part of the way of learning is to bring you all over uh, so that we can engage. And also because Asia really is, um, you know, a place where there are a lot of different vulnerabilities. I'm sure all regions have that, but there's also a lot of energy there. And why not? It's never been to Asia, so we thought, you know. Um... <laughs> <clears throat> Between, we are thinking of May 2024, um, and that one of the things we would like to invite our Asian counterparts is, even though it, you know, we are sort of convening the Southeast Asia and South Asian hub, we want it to be a truly Asian experience. So we invite those from the East Asia, from the Pacific, Asia Pacific region, right, uh, to come together. And let's think through how we put an exciting program together. What I think we would love to do, of course, is to get the guidance from the Planetary Health Alliance Secretariat on how to build upon what we've learned here. I think we, we need to find a way uh, to, uh, to, to sort of look back at what happened here and what progress has been made. We also want to make it a bit more of an action-oriented um, uh, summit, uh, one that maybe you can experience if you're going to fly all the way to Malaysia, we've got to give you the real experience. Um, and uh, one where we hope we will bring very different communities into the discussion. So I'm thinking already of having Business for Planetary Health, uh, Indigenous People for Planetary Health, and little different groups and some way that we can interact with them both physically and virtually as well. Finally, I have something to share, a very short video clip. I'm very excited to announce that we will be organizing, in fact, a summer school kind of program, summer school, winter school program called uh, Conservation Science for Planetary Health. I'm going to show you a very short video clip. And what we hope is by 2024, this course is up and running and ready, that we might invite, maybe sponsor a couple of people to join uh, so they can come a little earlier or stay a little longer, particularly young people. Uh, to be able to experience this, or we can might be able to tailor a short, you know, really on the ground experience for all the participants of Planetary Health uh, 2024. So with that, if we can have the little video clip, please. Malaysia is one of the world's 12 mega diverse countries. 
with thousands of mammal, bird and coral species. Conserving Malaysia's remaining natural habitat is an essential element in our collective efforts to improve the health of our homeland and other countries so that we can thrive. This is the essence of the planetary health movement, an approach to humanity's engagement with the natural world. As Executive Director of the Sunray Centre for Planetary Health at Sunray University in Malaysia, I am clear that there is no time to lose. The planet is sick and its poor health is massively increasing our risk of illness and death. Conserving our natural environment, especially here in the tropics, protecting the health of the planet must be a top priority. And it is everyone's responsibility. What matters here matters to everybody around the world. And embedding the need to conserve our natural resources in what we do now and what we do in the future requires diverse interdisciplinary skills that can only be gained through a real-world immersive experience. No matter what your profession is or will be in the future, a medical doctor, a business leader, an engineer, a journalist or an artist, this course is for all. The planet needs your expertise. So what are you waiting for? Come join us. Welcome to the Sunway 5K Experience the world's first conservation and planetary health field course. The K in 5K stands for conservation knowledge. And in this course, students will participate in knowledge discourse, knowledge discovery, knowledge diffusion, and knowledge delivery. All of which will help you achieve conservation impact in whatever field you are in. Led by a team of experts at Sunway University, the Conservation and Planetary Health field course is different from other typical field courses. Here, we will equip you with state-of-the-art tools that you need to help conserve ecosystems and species wherever you are from, like nature-based solutions and persuasion science. At Sunway University, we believe in creating opportunities for all to receive a world-class educational experience. Students in this program will not only have an amazing experience in the wild, but they will also be welcomed to our state-of-the-art campus, located in our sustainable Sunway city. Our Sunway campus will provide you an opportunity to experience the vision of a sustainable city that our Foundation Chancellor and benefactor, Tan Sri Jeffrey Chia, created. In addition to classroom-based learning, the course will run in an array of 5K natural laboratories across Malaysia that include the urban forests on Kiara Hill in Kuala Lumpur, limestone casts in the Kinta Valley, the dipterocarp rainforests of Kenya Lake, coral reefs of Kapas Island, or the montane forests of Kinabalu Mountain. We welcome everyone from across the globe to join this unique experiential learning course in some of Earth's most incredible living laboratories. We assure you that you will leave this course feeling more connected, more relevant and having a greater purpose. A purpose for a greater good. Because there is no plan B and there is no planet B, we must fix our planetary home. So looking forward to welcome all of you to Malaysia. Thank you very much.